Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. There's a lot of times where we ask you, the listeners, to give us people that you want on the show. People that you'd recommend, uh, guests that might be off the beaten path. Today is one of those. Uh, we've got Craig Sawman Sawyer on the show and Dan and I, as, as well as the podcast and Jared, were tagged a bunch of times in his post, um, in particular regarding his uh, mission and his documentary, Contraland. Mm. Um, you, you tell the audience a little bit about his background because the guy has such an unbelievable story. It. It doesn't even seem real. He seems like a mythical figure to me. He's done a lot of stuff. So he started out in the Marine Corps um, in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. I think he spent about three years there. And um, then he went to uh, Bud's and became a SEAL, SEAL Team 1 for a while. Then he was with DevGrew, otherwise known as SEAL Team 6. He was a sniper there for a while. Um, and then he left and worked for – well, I don't know if we're, we can say that, but he, he worked – with Matt and Evan overseas for mm -hmm. a little while. Yep. Um, and now he's doing this. And he also, he's been on a lot of television too. He's done, uh, he was on Top Shot for a long time. Um, he is the operator's operator. He's a very good guy. Yeah. I, look, it's one of those people, as soon as you hear his voice and see his face, you know exactly who he is. Yeah. I believe um, he was a federal air marshal for a while too. So I don't, I don't think he does that anymore, but it would be funny. I think we should only hire celebrities to be air marshals. So you, so you know if you see like Zach Galifianakis on a plane, like he's probably got a gun, <laughs> right? Or Eddie Murphy. That's my great. that's my that's the buddy cop movie I want to see. I don't care about Nick Nolte. I want to see Eddie Murphy and Zach Galifianakis. Uh, that's a good that's a in good a, combo in a buddy cop movie. That's, that's a good what combo. I see. Instead, we're getting Coming to America too. Thirty five uh, years later, uh, with Tiffany Haddish. By the way, yeah, gross. Uh, I mean, she's I like her, but the the remaking the movies thing is over. Come on. Uh, well, it's a sequel. Allegedly, so we'll see. It's going to suck. <laughs> Just like Ghostbusters, the girl version sucked. The only one that's got it right is Bridesmaids. They fucking nailed it. That movie's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. But I, that's you can make a movie about any group of people, regardless of their ethnic background or their gender. You can make that movie a crazy fucking party movie, and it's going to be funny. It doesn't matter. They made it about fucking teenagers. They made it about fucking old people. Yeah. That movie has been made a million times, and every single time it works. That's a different story, so don't let that... Get into your head. This movie's going to suck. Bridesmaids is the female hangover for sure. Yeah. Uh, but Craig um, runs a nonprofit called Veterans for Child Rescue. Look, today's one of the most powerful shows we've ever had. This is a, a subject um, that a lot of people won't talk about. And we decided to have him on mm -hmm. today. Uh, it's about sex trafficking. Um, and it's about pedof pedophilia. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got a very real... Uh, approach to his life and uh it's it was difficult to talk about I, I, i'm even having trouble kind of summarizing what we discuss um because as a parent it, it, it's hard to talk about these subjects mm. um and his will hit particularly close to home because it happened to him as a father but first we have some sponsors who put us on the air day in and day out and we are extremely grateful to them first and foremost Ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Best in the biz, kids. Ghostbed.com's running a big Memorial Day sale. I know what you're thinking. It's it's the day after Memorial Day. Uh, no, no, it's not. It's still running. That Memorial Day sale is going to run through June 5th, where if you order a bundle package, you get 30% off uh, the entire bundle package. But as always, things are still 25% off. I'm not sure how far they're going to take this. They were just going to take it into the quarantine ending of like May 30th, mm -hmm. but I don't know anymore. Um, I know this. If you get a if you get a mattress, you get two free pillows, um, which is amazing. The pillows are almost as good as the goddamn mattress itself. Uh, they got three versions of it. The classic, the cooling mattress, and, uh, and the big dog. Uh, look on their website. You'll see what the big dog is. That's got everything in it. That'll cool you down real nice. I think they call it the cooling mattress. I don't know. Yeah, but the, I call it the big dog. The Rottweiler. Yeah, it's nice. That thing will cool you down as summer is approaching. As always, they got the 36-month pay-as-you-go program. No interest on that. 
Go to ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros today. All of those deals are still applicable with their 36 month pay as you go program. Uh, so peep it out. Next up, we got killcliffcbd.com. Danthony, is there anything better than drinking Kill Cliff on Memorial Day weekend? Um, with vodka. With vodka, yeah. <laughs> um, no, not no, the best. No. I've yeah. actually I've started drinking them even earlier in the day. Have you? Yeah. You, you're you're past the quarantine. You're you're all done with it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think all of us are. Um, and look, this is the first time things, at least around our area, are starting to open. Still no gyms here, man. Uh, that's uh, well, th- we'll no see. gyms and bars. There was a gym that filed a lawsuit today against the the, the government of North Carolina. Good. Good. We'll see, uh, it's actually a group of uh, seven gyms now, but I'm sure that'll increase. Great, great. Yeah. I, look, we need those open. Uh, until then, I'm drinking KillCliffCBD.com to cool down my nerves. Uh, three amazing flavors. Grape, uh, original, and uh, well, the original is is the, the orange kush, mm-hmm. uh, but the mango is the new one. Um, 20% off with the promo code DRINKINGBROS at KillCliff.com and KillCliffCBD.com. Because, mm. Dan, you drink a lot of KillCliff as well. Yep. So it's for both. We want to let everybody know that it's, it's for both. KillCliff.com. Promo code Drink and Bros, 20% off and free shipping. And KillCliffCBD.com, 20% off and free shipping. Uh, last but not least, Anthony, we've got GetRoman.com forward slash Drinking Bros. Get Roman. By the way, uh, Jerry Sloan just died. He did. They did, the coach uh, of the Utah do you, Jazz. Do you think it was because of the last dance? He saw those that finals loss again. He was like, you know what? Fuck this. Oof. I'm out. Tough call. Because I, I, I think he came off kind of pimpy in that. I mean, he's 78, so he probably just died of natural causes like 78-year-olds he, often He did. Do. He had uh, Parkinson's and yeah. uh, and, and some, er, some dementia. I, I, it's, you can't really say early onset dementia. With no, 78. 78 but, no. Uh, and Joe Flacco signed with the Jets. Did he really? Yeah. Look at that. So, which is like, that's another version of death, I guess. Breaking news. Yeah. <laughs> Boy. Uh, yeah, all of it. Uh, quarantine, Joe Flacco. I don't know who I would Jerry rather Sloan be down. right now, Jerry Sloan or Joe Flacco. And that says all you need to know about the New York Jets organization. <laughs> Leave it to Dan to drop a death joke during the middle of a boner ad, Well, which is amazing. Sometimes, if you, look, if you're a depressor, you're going to need that pill to get it up. So. Yeah, you're goddamn right you are. Uh, since Jerry can't, you can. Yeah, Go fuck. GetRoman.com for slash drinking bros today. Go out there and then blast one out for Jerry. Yeah, blast one out for Jerry. Um, look, you get free shipping. It's a five second questionnaire, essentially. Uh, it's a free online doctor visit. And then they ship you the pills in the mail. It's discreet. Your wife won't know. Your mom won't know. Your kids, your mistress, your gay lover. No one will know. You got a little boner enhancement. And look, this isn't just for people with erectile dysfunction. This is for people who just want to have great recreational sex on the weekend. I like it when uh, single people tell me on Valentine's Day that they're going to stay home and take a Viagra. Yeah. I I just don't tell me any more than that because I want to imagine the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to like it. Are you lighting candles? Yeah. Is it a a Zoom call? (laughs) What kind of alcohol is involved? Um, You know. Yeah, we'll find out. Yeah. We'll find out. Go to GetRoman.com forward slash Drinking Bros today. And then last but not least, we got MyBookie.com. Promo code Drinking Bros doubles your deposit. I believe we're going to have John Anik on tomorrow, um, who's going to cover the UFC fights, uh, including all the odds with us. Uh, You and I have been on fire on that. Mm -hmm. So it'll be cool to have John back on tomorrow and discuss that. He's one of the very best in the business. So it's it's nice to uh, to tease out that episode because he's he's one of our favorite uh, is one of our favorite guests we have uh, John Anik and tonight um, is is one of the most powerful episodes we've ever done. Uh, here is Craig Sawman Sawyer. Welcome to Drinking Bros. We've got a very special episode for you tonight. One of the things that we've talked about for years on this show is our hatred for pedophiles. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been very adamant about it. We've had dream murdering sessions about it on air. Um, and one of our co-hosts, that's his whole mission in life, is to make enough money so that after uh, he retires that he can just end pedophiles on this earth. Uh, yeah, it's not about like anger or revenge, though, for me personally. It's... it's uh they are it's like the there's a there's a cia assassination manual by an operator named john minnery from Mm -hmm. the 1970s and it's he discusses a bunch of like tactical methods and stuff but also the mindset behind doing what what they do and the idea is that you 
that person needs to go and you just get rid of them like you're swatting a fly. No big deal. Right. It's not like that. You can't get your emotions involved. And that's something that Craig Sawyer and Sawyer, our guest today, can talk to us about. Because honestly, mm-hmm. I don't know. I've watched your documentary. I've watched some of your other specials. Contraland, yes. Contraland. I can't understand how you guys maintain control of yourselves in that room and not just tear that motherfucker's head right off his body. Because honestly, I would want to. Yeah, well, it, that goes back to <laughs> a self-discipline. If you really want to have a long-term effect... Uh, in the in the operation, the mission, uh, you, you've got to do it right, right? So let's go back to my my counter terrorist time at Dev Group. Dev Group, when you're going through the training there, if you if you burst into a room, if you shoot an unknown or an innocent person rather than a bad guy, you're going to be dragging a tire until you're barfing, uh, and, and and you'll come back exhausted if you come back at all. It's a continued training, so that it's no good to for the president to task Dev Group to fly halfway around the world to rescue a the the ambassador or the ambassador's wife, only to have them uh, shoot the the hostage. Right, so that's that's a no go. So you've got to be accurate with what you do. You've got to be disciplined to come up with the long term solution and the result that you're after. So you know, I've also been in federal law enforcement. I was a federal criminal investigator after I got out of the, the military. And so there's a there's a use of force continuum there that's different than the military rules of engagement. And so if I wanted to continue to color guys, I gotta color inside the lines. Mm, right. Yeah. If I scribble outside the lines and satisfy myself on one of these fools, then uh, I don't get to color anymore. And so that's kind of the bottom line. I hope guys can understand is like, man, if you want to keep continue creating a cultural turnaround against this sort of predation upon children you got to do it righteously or you're not going to get to do it for very long at all (laughs) so by keeping my nose clean and and being a professional and working with the different law enforcement entities because we have up to nine agencies at a time and on some of these operations i mean the house is just full of of guys and of course the canine unit that's the hysterical thing we could talk about with you know you're you're about to uh, calling the SWAT team a couple guy and, and you can hear I can hear the, the canine you, <laughs> <laughs> the dogs are smart man they're they're working guys they they understand what's going to happen especially after the first uh, the first iteration the first takedown so then you hear that dog around the corner getting fired up and he's just trying not to laugh but uh, yeah so that's what it is, is guys it's just doing the job carefully and accurately and professionally so that we could continue doing it and so that one day our kids aren't being hunted here in our own homeland to the degree that they are now this is not okay guys this is this is this is a bunch of bs man what's yeah. going on right now it, we got here. it's awful and um you know this show has a, a huge reach we have about nine million listeners a month and with that we always ask the audience hey tag us in an interesting guest that you would love to have on the show that might be unexpected that might be somebody you don't know who's not a household name. Your name came up over and over and over again. So finally, I reached out to you through Instagram and I said, hey, man, the audience is requesting you on the show. I'd like to more learn more about you, more about your organization and more about your documentary. Um, now, did you found Veterans for Child Rescue? Yes, I did. And I founded it not because I wanted to run a nonprofit organization, because quite frankly, I wanted a nonprofit or the liability of one like I wanted a hole in the head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it, was, it was about six six years ago that a, a CIA friend of mine, that um, and and as you guys know, the the, the founders of a Black Rifle Coffee are mm-hmm. friends of mine. We used to work on the same contract together, mm-hmm. so uh, there's some of the synergy there too. But uh, a friend of mine said, "Craig, this area that we grew up just north of Houston, Texas, is the epicenter of child sex trafficking," and. Uh, I had done, you know, some film and television work by then. I'd been in a couple movies, and I'd been on uh, five seasons of History Channel's Top Shot, and and so I reached out to some of my production company friends, and I said, "Hey, look, man, um, I, I learned over in Africa doing the counter poaching work for Rhino Wars that if you can film something, you can alert the populace to it and bring a lot bigger corrective mechanism than you could just running the operations." covertly like we're all accustomed to doing and so that's when i learned that the alert piece and the media piece can really be powerful at, uh, at rallying greater support so i said let's let's film a documentary and expose this thing 
let's let's blow this up. Let's shine the the, the sunlight on this cesspool of child sex trafficking uh, because the the bad guys are enjoying <laughs> a lot of top cover. They're enjoying the the benefits of secrecy and and their covert operation against our children. Yeah. And so uh, everybody kept slow rolling me. Hollywood, they weren't really interested in, in exposing that at all. Why? Because so many of the big Hollywood execs are complicit. We know that now. Well, it's not just it's not just Hollywood execs. It's people in in our federal government as well. Clearly, like you, just in your uh, obviously in your documentary, we saw a couple of lower level federal government people involved uh, in in the day to day bullshit. But just conspiratorially with with the Epstein case, Bill the, Clinton. I, th- and, I feel like the yeah. pu- the public's. I, I don't know if it's the public's appetite for this particular type of material and they just can't it, it's it's too mentally fucked up for them to handle and they can't keep it on the front of their mind enough to prosecute these people and get them out of federal service or if it's the federal service itself whether right or left or indifferent is so complicit in all this that everybody's in on the secret and nobody will come forward and fucking do something about it because look these these little piecemeal measures like megan's law is great all these other laws are great, but pedophiles are still raping children and getting out of prison in 18 months. It's fucked up. And then we've done nothing to stop it. As a, as a government, we've done absolutely nothing to stop this shit from happening. Yeah, yeah, well, you're absolutely right. And all those things are true. But I was talking about in, in the beginning when I went to go film the documentary and found the, the organization, I realized that Big Hollywood wasn't going to fund a big documentary like they would fund something else. Like if I wanted to make a documentary about how cool it was to rape children, I probably could have gotten some some uh, crazy Hollywood people to fund that and made millions of dollars. But if you want to expose something that's that's truly evil that goes against their weird culture, they're not going to help you. So that's when I realized I needed to start uh, doing this independently. And I thought, okay, I'll crowdfund it. And I uh, started doing crowdfunding. And then all of the big tech companies, one by one, were undermining us and doing some real illegal, illegal stuff uh, to keep us from rallying the money to make the documentary, to alert the people, uh, to, to expose the, the crime and, and put a stop to it to safeguard kids. So I'm like, oh, God, this is getting stupid. So then I realized uh, through some friends say, okay, you're going to have to found a nonprofit organization just in order to raise the money they're going to stop you every other way and i'm like wow that sounds like a nightmare of bureaucrat bureaucracy and red tape but uh if that's what it's going to take to save kids then i guess that's my new mission i need to learn how to think outside of the box and fight however is required because i i can't fix child trafficking with a belt fed machine gun and rockets that it doesn't work that way i have to find a new way to fight if i really have a heart for the kids and really want to matter i have to have the moral courage to step up and, and and fight the way that's effective against it. And that is exposing it, compromise the whole thing. So, yep, I founded Veterans for Child Rescue. We started rallying the funds and we started filming the documentary. And then came all the hatred. As soon as we started arresting real predators, man, Craig Sawyer's name was mud out there with a lot of people. There wasn't enough uh, you know, hatred and smear campaign and character assassination going on. It's just nuts and it's not what it wasn't from legitimate credible sources who have who have done anything for children it wasn't from uh spec ops veterans it wasn't from C- senior cia officials or or law enforcement or anybody like that it was from twitter dweebs and youtubers who were trying to get you know clicks and saying horrible things about it you know decorated veteran in order to, to get themselves more clicks so that they can monetize their YouTubes. And it's disappointing to see how far a lot of those rumors and trash talking sessions have gotten. And uh, I, I see it every day. The people still say, you work for Hillary. I can't support you. I'm like, you idiots. I've never worked for Hillary. I've called, I've called for her prosecution boldly for over 10 years, man. And uh, <laughs> it's just, it's silly. The, but that's kind of what, what goes on, too. I think even if George Soros is subversive groups, uh, he pays a lot of them to run counter uh, information and, and, uh, and disinformation campaigns. Even if some of those are paid, it's just petty stuff that they're able to come up with. So I guess that's one benefit of living a relatively clean life and keeping my nose clean. They, they have nothing legitimate to throw at. You know, they can 
they can not like me or, or, yeah if they want but they can't they can't hold me up for some sort of scandal or some sort of wrongdoing because it's that stuff's not there so i guess that's that's one benefit <laughs> yeah i you know with our listeners they had tagged us over and over again and said hey it is important to get this guy's story out there will you please get in touch with him uh people who had seen the film people who follow you on instagram people who know who you are uh in the community and we said we said absolutely uh, i want to go back to something you said earlier about um north of houston being one of the hot spots why why is that can you tell everybody why that is that particular area I don't know why it is still to this day. It, it, it upset me because the, the culture there is so counter to this. Had they said L.A. where where people are trying to reinvent morality, like anything goes, right? Whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, no laws, no rules, you know, mayhem, rape children, it's fine. I would have found that more plausible. That would have made more sense to me. But just north of Houston, Texas, I'm like, wait a minute. This is cowboy country. This right. is downtown USA. Yeah. In my mind, I grew up there, <laughs> right? So I, if there was a downtown USA flagpole, it should have been right in my front yard because that was the culture there. So I did not understand why that was the epicenter for it. Well, so, I would imagine that it's, guess, just, there's this, it's the same reason that Homeland Security has immigration checkpoints hundreds of miles past the border because things – happen at the border it's easy to sneak past there look not everybody comes through a legitimate checkpoint and all that stuff and there are there are hot spots where people like truck stops where people refuel mm -hmm. there are certain pieces of infrastructure inside the united states like major highways that mm -hmm. lead from south to north that they have to take to get in certain areas where we know uh the distribution of the drugs or children or whatever it is guns whatever it happens to be are happening so they put they patrol along those lines and north of houston just happens to probably be one of, one of the hot spots for sex trafficking would be my guess yeah well you know look at houston you got major you got i-10 that runs through there you got yeah. i-45 north that runs yep. up to dallas you've got uh, ports there and so and there's a lot of money there's old yep. oil money there so there's, there's a lot of wealth and there's a lot of people and it's heavily populated now and uh, a lot of people, you know, but but they kind of. I think a lot of it is really exploiting the naivety of the people because most people there don't expect to see that. And what I was getting explained to me is well, sometimes it's in a wealthier neighborhood where one of the houses is a is a child sex trafficking house, and they got kids in cages in the bedrooms, and people come in, in the middle of the night. And just go in and rape the kids and leave and the neighbors are unwitting to it so it's happening right under their noses they don't know to be suspicious so i think uh if i have my way contraland will wake people up and they'll start looking and watching for things and they'll start videoing license plates taking pictures if you see something say something start dogging these bastards so that they can't do this anywhere without people just absolutely hunting them you know for for us in a covert operation let's say we're snipers and we were dropped into an enemy territory where an enemy country where they hate Americans and a little shepherd boy or something runs across us and oh a sniper 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 and he runs into the village a sniper 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 now you got thousands of people mm. beating the bushes looking for you well you got a problem right yeah <laughs> you got the military out combing the combing the land looking for you now you're in a hostile environment and that hostile environment guys is what I'm trying to create out of the United States on behalf of the children. I think we all need to be those villagers looking for the predators going, hey, not here, guys. You better find another crime spree because we're coming for you. You guys better be afraid. You need, you're the ones that need to be terrified because uh, our children are sacred and you, and you just don't, you, you keep your hands off of them or we'll string you up, man. It's, it's not well, cool. it's, in, it's interesting you say that because uh, I guess I, I don't want to say one of my concerns is this because this is not a concern, but uh, when you get the public involved in something that's so emotionally uh, uh, out there as this, you have to expect at some point some level of vigilante justice, right? I mean, we just saw it last week. Some dude fucking beat a pedophile to death or some shit. Yeah. I don't remember. Or he shot him. I don't remember what happened exactly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm not opposed to that anyways. I know you probably, because of your work with law enforcement, uh, ongoing work with law enforcement, can't really sign on to shit like that. But every time I hear about a pedophile getting murdered, I'm like, all right, cool. What, yeah, yeah, what, yeah, what yeah. else? Yeah. What else? Ne happened next today? story. Yeah. yeah what How else? did the Mets do today? Yeah. I don't give two yeah, fucks. I'm not going to lose sleep over the bad guys finally getting caught because our, our justice system is so corrupted that uh, the judges let these guys out so early. 
Yeah, I mean, if not a victim at all. Look, our daughters. Our, let's talk about this, guys. Our daughter's rapist. Uh, it, it took two and a half years to bring him to trial. He was allowed to go through. I think it was either fourteen or seventeen. I'm going to go with fourteen. I can't. It's starting to fade from my memory already because I like to forget about this clown. Fourteen public defenders. It was unprecedented. Tucson, Arizona. Every time this serial rapist and lifelong criminal, a ward of the state from from childhood, would would rape a woman or or uh, or, or no back to the trial. Every time that that he was assigned an attorney, he would get in an argument with the attorney, and then before it would go to trial, this guy would fire his attorney. And so the court would assign him a new one and let him reset and push back the trial date. So he played that game for two and a half years. And every time that our daughter was notified that her rapist was not going to be made to go to trial, it re-traumatized her again. And she was, uh, it really messed her up and just the court system being, being weak. And, uh, so in the trial, our daughter testified so powerfully that girl, guys, you want to talk about a warrior. I don't know how a little girl can be that brave and bold and professional but she really was and so she testified uh, while he was allowed to represent himself he the, the perp ended up representing himself and berating her and and allowed to just throw all kinds of fake accusations at her when any judge would not any legit judge would not tolerate that this judge let him go and let him try to humiliate her and accuse her of all kind of things on the witness stand so she just stuck to the facts and she put him away. In the end, the the jury convicted him on all seven counts. And it was like, boom, 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 guilty, 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 guilty. Yeah. And they even still, the judge gave him the minimum. He goes, well, I don't, judge said, I don't see why I'd be inclined to give him more than the minimum. But thank God the the minimum was 68 years. So only only the jury brought justice in that. I think the judge... The judge talked to this crook like it was his long lost uh, son or nephew. Talked to him very softly and gently, and and uh, you know it was like wow, what he uh, it was just disturbing. So yeah, we we have to have stronger judges, guys. There seems to we be a level of there seems to be a level of tolerance for this particular. Like I would say, there's a four or five types of behavior that rank among the lowest things that a human being can do, like the most abjectly evil things that a human being can do. Obviously, those include abusing children and there seems to be a level of tolerance for this that before I really dove into this subject would I would not have expected it and I don't understand why it exists I don't understand why anyone would stand up for these people in any way uh, like the, the the recidivism numbers the average like you say in the documentary the average uh, sexual predator compromises something like 70 children and throughout their quote-unquote life lifestyle or, or uh, uh, lifespan. Life, lifespan yeah lifespan as a as a predator mm -hmm. something about 70 or 72 children I think it is on average that they compromise whatever compromise means whether they're get, getting groomed or whether they actually get fucking assaulted um, so with that and the the high recidivism rate uh, I don't I don't get it like what, what's the hold up here why why can't we pass legislation or at least just fuck let's just shoot these motherfuckers in the street i mean just get p pass out a couple of tags like they're deer during the year you get two tags per person per year <laughs> and we can go out and just shoot these motherfuckers in the face and look it's still on you if you shoot somebody that's not that guy it's just like any other job like if we're in i was in the 82nd airborne if you shoot the wrong person there's a fucking consequence to be paid for that uh like anywhere else i'm not saying let all the crazies lose but look these people have no place on our planet and the, the other part of that that we know is that the vast majority of these people ha were sexually abused when they were children. So all we're doing, like coronavirus has a one to three uh, viral ratio, which means every one person probably is going to infect three additional people, mm -hmm. right? In this community, and for the flu, it's one to one. Right. In this community, it's one to 72. But we ha somehow have more tolerance for fucking child rapists than we do somebody maybe having a respiratory infection. Yeah. I, it's, it, it boggles the mind that this is the case. Yeah, it's strange. It's and cultural. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a cultural it, sickness, guys. It and, is. And you saw it with Alfred Kinsey. He went politicking state by state with his falsified studies trying to, to force our system, our, our legal system, 
to be soft on child rape, our psychological health care system to be soft on child rape, and our educational system to be soft on child rape. And they are now. And so four generations later, we've got ourselves an epidemic. And so if one scumbag can start a cascading avalanche of destruction against children, I say a bunch of uh, good and decent patriots can start a positive avalanche of change. If our culture can be poisoned, our culture can be healed and, and grow back into one that is protective of children rather than the predatory culture that we had festered into over the last few decades. Uh, was your child's rape part of the reason that you got into this? No, um, it's, it was an aggravating factor uh, in the end. That's, that's the real bottom line. I had already committed to this. I'd already thrown my hat in the ring. I'd already gotten my heart broken and got ticked off and, just, and committed to this. And, um, and then our daughter turned up missing and we got her back. But um, was that, was that surreal? Was that, like, was it, was, was it, was it almost, surreal that you were already fighting for this and then it happened at home? Because a lot of people out there who are watching and or listening hear a case like this and they're like, there's no way this could happen to Craig Sawyer. There's no way it could happen to a guy like this, right? Um, because he would be there and he would murder these people and there is no way you're fucking with a guy like Craig Sawyer. Was, yeah. the, sh what, was the shock of that like surreal to you? I, I did have to wonder what they were thinking. and uh, um, But of course, your precious little baby girl, your daughter is, is not you. Mm. And you can't make her uh, have the level of vigilance that, that you've learned through a lifetime in, in different war zones, right? So uh, we try to teach our children, but they're individuals. And um, when it happened, uh, I, I was just, I was, I was stunned. Of course, I woke up in the middle of the night. My wife was the one that woke me up, you know, saying, hey, Craig, it's Aspen on the phone. She's, been, she's just been raped. And I could hear our baby girl screaming in the phone. And so I spun up out of bed at like four o'clock in the morning, at whatever time it was. I think it was right about that time. Uh, like, like I was in a war zone again, like spinning, like problem solving, like, mm. okay, what do I need? I'm gonna grab this, this, and this. Where are you, baby girl? Give me your cross streets and I'm inbound. And I'm gonna call the sheriff's department, have them intervene because they're probably closer to you than I am. They'll probably get to you first. Let's, let's hard point on something. I'm, I'm just problem solving. I'm tactically thinking, Okay, baby girl, where are you? Give me a cross street. And, and of course, she was, our daughter was hysterical. She wasn't stopping for anything. So she was speeding even through red lights and everything else coming home. So I had uh, sheriff's department at the house uh, before she got there. And we, we took her to the hospital. And because she, she decided immediately that she was going to fight back. She didn't want daddy to make it go away. She wanted to fight back and get this guy. And so... Um, the lead detective asked me, she said, uh, are you the father? And I said, yeah, I'm the father. And she said, okay, well, just, you'll have to realize we'll, you know, this will probably take us quite a long time to get the, the perpetrator. So just, you know, be prepared to have patience. And my wife kind of chuckled and, and the detective looked at us like, what's going on? I said, well, look, uh, you don't have that kind of time. If you plan on beating me to him, <laughs> I figure I can figure I can have him pretty quick, and uh, and she looked at her partner and she looked at my wife. My wife's like, "You better listen to him." And they said, uh, "Will you excuse us for a minute?" And the two detectives went outside for about twenty minutes and they came back in. Now it's Mr. Sawyer. Mr. Sawyer, we're going to make this our first priority. Our you know we're committed to this, and they did. They said, "Please just give us give us seventy two hours, please." And uh, I'm like, well, you don't want him burned alive on the mayor's front yard? Because, I mean, I can imagine him strung up upside down and all kinds of, you know, satisfying things for me. And they're like, no, 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 let us let us get him. And, and to their credit, they did. They did a SWAT raid on the they, – they figured out where he was, did a SWAT raid on the house. It was a dry hole. Uh, but then they, the next day, I actually met the officer that made the chance contact stop. Uh, thought he recognized him, stopped him, and uh, – and made uh, the arrest. So they had him pretty quickly. And uh, so that's good Good work on the job of uh, Tucson Police Department. I appreciate our brothers and sisters there 
uh, that, that that worked on that because it was they were impassioned about it too. Uh, they don't like that, you know, child predator stuff going on. But we need we need stronger judges who are going <laughs> to put these guys away. It's it's no good letting them right back out because it's a serial type of predation. These people's minds are sick. They, they you heard Bob Hamer from the FBI, who's also on our mm. board, uh, as is Jack Farmer and Judith Reisman and Admiral Moore. Um, you, you heard Bob talk about these guys admitting from NAMBLA, the North American Man Boy Love Association pedophiles. They, they they told Bob, we'll never change. We'll always want what we want, but we'll just tell the court appointed uh, counselors whatever they need to hear. And so we need to realize that as a culture, these people are sick and they're going to continue doing it as long as they're physically able. So we can't loose them back out on the children like that. That's a, uh, you're not doing a service to anybody. It's not merciful to let a predator back out. It's it's harmful. Uh, knowing what happened to you and going through the process of it, I can only imagine that fueled your fire from when you went back to Veterans for Child Rescue and said, all right, uh, I I went through this personally as a father. Um, these kids that I'm you know trying to protect out there, um, I know what their parents are probably going through. And uh, I can only imagine, you know, it amplified your work after that it did and a lot of guys you know not not everybody's going to understand this gents but it's part of the reality i'm going to say it this predation against the children is the front line between good and evil it, it's a spiritual conflict it absolutely is and that's what the the detectives that first explained to me the nature of the the cases that they were on they're like your badge and gun really aren't going to be much good against this because what you have, you, you've got multiple layers of this this crime spree, uh, domestic uh, child sex trafficking. And one layer is criminal enterprise, right? It's multi-billion dollar criminal enterprise. A lot of people that want power and money from that. Then you got the political corruption and all the blackmail layer of it. And uh, a lot of our politicians are rancidly corrupt and they're involved in this. And their own film from Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein's island and his mm -hmm. mansion, and other New York City mansions and castles and all, all these places where they go and they do these things. And then you've got an element of it that's sexual perversion. And But once you get all, all past all those layers, you have an element of some of these elite cult groups, are they make a pact with Lucifer to do the unthinkable to God's most precious and innocent children. And for them... I'm not saying I believe it, that they believe it. That's their sick mindset, that they benefit from doing that to the children. And so uh, they literally torture the children to death, and they get off. It's a sadistic thing where they get off on harming the kids. And I'm like, this is not okay, and I'm not going to stand by and, and, and uh, allow this to happen. People quote Edmund Burke all the time, evil prevails mm. when men do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I say, you know what? That's true. But if evil's prevailing and you're doing nothing, how is it that you're a good man? Yeah, I agree. And as a father of two, it's hard to hear and it's it's hard to have this conversation. And truthfully, it's almost uncomfortable because you it stirs up so many emotions when you're talking about it with especially another father that I think it is important to have this dialogue and get this out into the world. What can people look for? So you mentioned, you know, uh, one of the first things was it's a multi-billion dollar industry, right? Yeah. Uh, how much are people charging for these humans? And and what do you look for in this as far as like a, a pass off? Are they coming over the border? Is it happening domestically in our own you know, country? What's the first thing that Americans can look for uh, when trying to determine if someone is being trafficked like this? Yeah, well, it, it, it's uncomfortable, guys, because it's it's just bad, and and we all feel guilty because it's our country, and it's happening here. It's a domestic problem, and, and we have allowed it collectively to grow this this bad. So, it's is it is it Americans it's, selling though uh, other humans? Is that what yeah. it is? Is that what you're saying? So it, it it is Americans. It's not people coming over from the border or anything. It's it's all of the above, but the white. <laughs> American male is, disappointingly enough, the primary consumer of child sex. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's bad in other European nations. It's bad in, in Asian nations. But we are the number one consumer. 
So uh, a lot of Americans travel elsewhere to abuse children. And uh, some wealthy Americans uh, order foreign children of different types to be brought here. But the overwhelming majority of children that are being bought and sold and abused in the United States are being t- taken by CPS out of uh, viable and unviable homes. And they're going through the foster care system and eventually getting lost. And then they're eventually get uh, bought and sold outright. Some of them are, are runaways. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them are kidnapping victims. And so they get the children through a lot of different ways. And what you can look for, is a, it's a wide range of it, guys. So uh, let's say MS-13 now. MS-13 sells kids now. And uh, so do the Crips and the Bloods. They've all been brought into it through Mexican drug cartel who, who run the, the larger organization. And so you'll have the Crips and Bloods that would never have worked together before. and They still hate each other, but they'll cooperate just enough to hand off children and a pipeline uh, to bring kids across country throughout their, their different uh, regions. And so uh, someone like uh, MS-13, they'll sell children for pretty cheap because they're in ratted out motel rooms. And it's it's just for a trick to go in there and bang the kid and, and do whatever sick thing you've got in mind. <laughs> And then you're back out the door and the next dude's in, right? So that's that's a relatively low price tag. But some of the elites, if they want a child for a, a kidney transplant or something like that, and they're just going to kill the kid, they'll pay a lot of money. Or if they're going to have a satanic ritual, they want a certain flavor of child that looks a certain way for whatever kind of sick thing they got, they may pay a lot of money. So we're seeing a wide spectrum of that. So I would say look for... Look for children that are, especially around any big sporting events, or not necessarily sporting events, but any big trade shows where you got a lot of wealthy men converging on a city, like the Super Bowl, like uh, the mineral and gym shows, like uh, Formula One races, these kinds of things. Uh, there's a lot of uh, horn and pimping to, to cater to the clientele, and a percentage of that are children. So look for children being moved in and out of Airbnb homes around these towns and cities at night uh, for parties or, or individuals. L- look for them moved in and out of hotels, you know, uh, during these same type of events. Look for children that don't look happy, that doesn't look like it makes sense that they're with their family and being cared for and looked after, but rather just being moved as a, as a piece of property. So look for a lot of those telltale signs and, um, and, you know, one thing that we can do, even if we can't all spot it individually, we can demand stronger enforcement. We can demand better legislation to defend our children. On vetsforchildrescue.org, we've got a take action section with a drop down menu to find your elected officials that don't already know who they are. And as American citizens, we should. But we make it easy for you. And there's also a form letter. If you're not a good writer, take our form letter, fill in the blanks. Send it right then and there to your elected officials demanding stronger protections for our children, stronger enforcement against these predators, so that we start to turn our culture back around to one that we can all be proud of, guys. That's that's what we fought for. That's what we defend. And this is our America. It's not the scumbags America. So we just have to stand up and and denounce it and uh, and be bold. And our culture got, uh, you know, rotted away and we got beat up by the the, the culture bullies are telling us that we have to be politically correct and condone these things. Well, I'll never condone it. Nobody's ever going to beat me up and bully me with political correctness to say raping a child is is okay. It's never okay. It's not. It's never going to be okay. So we can we can create the the culture that we like and respect back out of our United States because we have a voice, man. It's, it belongs to us. That's what our founding fathers wanted. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you said uh, you were talking about the Super Bowl just a second ago. Um, One of the biggest events, there was a a friend of ours, uh, Dan and I, that I tried to meet up with for for lunch. And it was at the Super Bowl three years ago in Houston. Uh, It was actually the Atlanta Falcons against the the Patriots. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, man, I'm working. He's, He's in your line of work as well. And he said, this is the most sex trafficked uh, Super Bowl of all time because it was in Houston and, um, you know, because it is the Super Bowl itself. And I, I didn't understand, you know, uh, what, he, what he meant until you were talking about it of, yes, there is a lot of wealthy people from 
you know, all over the world or, or America. This is one of their, you know, bucket list items. And they're in for the weekend and treating this like a fucking party. And they're trying to get whatever they possibly can out of it. And he said, I was working around the clock from beginning of the Super Bowl until the end, you know, three or four days in advance till two days afterwards. Um, and it was that one in Houston. Is that the one that he mentioned specifically? Yeah, that's sickening, brother. I mean, I, it just shouldn't. It's not something that's supposed to exist. I mean, what, what, what kind of of pathetic, weak character leads to treating a small child that way? I mean, it's just it's not something that we can or should ever condone in any way. So. I'll condemn it and I'll fight against it for the rest of my days. I wonder how bad it has to really get before uh, we just start shooting these motherfuckers in the street, to be honest. Like, how yeah. bad does it have to get before some FBI agent goes, you know, uh, uh, to the, goes to the vault and grabs all the Epstein files and this gives them the WikiLeaks or something like that? Like, why the fuck have I not seen that information? That's what I don't understand either. Yeah, like, somebody has it. And it was, there was about to be a trial in New York. That information does exist somewhere. Why isn't that out in the, in the public right now? Yeah, it needs to be. Look, uh, it, at first, when I saw a lot of these these leaks, I was, I was upset about it because I was still working in the covert realm on behalf of uh, Uncle Sam. And I'm like, man, I've blown the whistle as a national security whistleblower. I blew the whistle on a corrupted uh, FBI SES level executive when I was in the Federal Air Marshal Service after my military time and but i did it internally is at the lowest level possible mm -hmm. and i certainly wasn't blasting out a bunch of uh operational secrets internationally right but i realized that's not what wikileaks did wikileaks just released the emails of corrupted officials and let we the people read it for ourselves and i think uh that that was a fantastic contribution mm -hmm. and i think uh you know once you have a log jam guys once you've got gridlock with corruption and you can't prosecute the people within the system, then I think the system needs to be compromised and things like WikiLeaks need to happen to release the uh, the evidence and so the people can kind of break that logjam and, and restructure our DOJ to get back to a more legitimate and truly effective system for our best interests. Because right now what we have, it ain't working because look at the high level rancid treasonous crooks that are making a mockery of our system right now. Uh, we could name probably 100 people right off the top of our heads between the three of us uh, that, that are guilty of sedition and both, treason. Like everybody on both sides of the political aisle, pe Correct, people yeah. that are elected officials, people that w just work for government, mm -hmm. people that are involved in politics as financiers, they're all fucking complicit in this shit. And somehow we've... We, it seems like we've just swallowed the, the hard pill to swallow, which is that we can't do anything about it. But fuck that. Like it's, it's become, it, I feel like we're, we're getting close to a, a breaking point with a lot of things. This COVID-19 thing highlight, has highlighted a lot of it with the, uh, I mean, it's a very clear attempt to erode certain rights away. And some like it, it with it does it's not, I don't, I don't think COVID-19 was, was created for that reason. Right. But I think anything that comes up, the left is going to try to take more rights away mm -hmm. and the right is going to try to monetize more. That's just what those two institutions do typically. So now that it's, now that it's become one of this, uh, we've never had anything like this. No. A shutdown of this nature we've never had. And it's, I feel like I've said it on the show the other day, I feel like people are going to go one or two directions. They're either going to be like, they're going to lose all trust and hope in the government mm -hmm. or they're going to fucking be like, well, I guess this is how it is now, and fuck that. If if it's just, if it's the latter, then we're like this. That's not America. That's not what this country is. No, it's it's not what this country is. And and to Dan's point, it leads to people breaking, people having street justice, and then incidents like last week, yeah. where that guy just went and shot the pedophile himself. You're going to start to see more and more of that um, coming to fruition, but you know. <sighs> How can we help as, as average American citizens? I think the thing is, is our elected officials only get away with what we allow them to. Our, our founding fathers were some pretty cool dudes, man, in their outlook of, of the culture that they were trying to create here, right? They, they against all odds, they wanted to create a, a culture where the people run the show rather than the big oligarchs and the tyrants. Mm -hmm. 
and it was a it was a bold experiment in freedom, man. It's the most daring thing ever. And so they said, hey, you, you got yourself a, a constitutional republic if you can keep it. Well, since its founding, it's been under attack from uh, from all the global elite who wanted to undermine us. So I, I would say that we have to get back in the habit of rolling up our sleeves and asserting ourselves in the political process. Look, when I was growing up and when I was in the military and even when I was in the federal law enforcement, I didn't want to be bothered with politics because it was contentious. It was mm. ugly. It was heated, right? I'm mm. like, I, I hate politicians. I don't want any part of it. Well, what that's done with us, with too many of us taking that attitude and that, that approach, we've left the, the storehouse to the rats, so to speak. Guys like us, we don't want power. We don't want to be in charge of stuff and tell everybody what to do. We just want to run our companies and and run our lives, right? Run our families and have fun and, yep. and, and enjoy the liberty that we fought for and that we, we enjoy here. But the rats, the scumbags, fight and claw relentlessly for those positions of a power which they abuse. And so we've allowed it to go too far. So now we have to realize we do pull the strings we just have to do it we have to assert ourselves we have to get back in there and go no fool you're out you you didn't do what we told you so now you're out of the way and we're going to put someone else in that'll actually serve us in good faith do you think that's even feasible at this point do you think it's do you think it's even feasible at this point where youtube which is google and facebook can uh can edit doctors off because they don't agree with what's going on in the public sphere right now with regard to coronavirus or whatever else they they even have his even your documentary yeah, even your documentary is clearly being shadow banned because i saw i've seen yeah. it in a number of places and it i had to look really fucking hard for it i had to put Same. literally i searched for it and i had to put the exact name in there i put contraland in there and nothing showed up i'm like what the fuck so i put the entire name of the thing in and then finally i, I put the name and the publisher in and it finally it showed up mm -hmm. right so like social media and and tech companies run the United States now. Not, not only do they run the United States, but when the United States tell like gets mad at them, they're like, "Hey, shut the fuck up, yeah. government. You don't control us. They don't pay taxes. They don't do anything. They don't contribute in yeah, any look, real way." Look at what they do when they finally bring them in before Congress. They don't swear them in. No, they just sweat. It's a mockery. Yeah. yeah. And then you got some of these guys slobbering and sucking up to them like, "Oh, Mr. Zuckerberg, you're not only handsome, but a powerful man." Kiss, kiss. I'm like, what on earth kind of uh, interrogation session is that? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, but keep heart. Take heart, guys. Keep hope there. I, I know a guy, he's a technologist. He spent 20 years creating a new code writing method that's better than what big tech in Silicon Valley has done. And he's rolling out a new, um, he, well, he's got a football app, a, a global soccer app that's fantastic, and it's worth a fortune. And he's he's rolling out a social media app that's better than Facebook, better than Twitter, better than Instagram, and it does kind of what each of those do with a couple of other functions. And once that's out, uh, a lot of people will migrate over to it. So that's one example of there is there are white hats out there. There are patriots that are doing things, and I think we just have to do more of it we've right. we've allowed the rats to take over the storehouse we've allowed the zuckerbergs and and the gates of, of this world to take over and have too much influence and we uh we've just gotta we gotta we gotta just take back over man right. and do everything that we can and elevate good people and we need to get more more active at tearing these these uh scumbags down man and uh boycotting them and every, everything else that we can do from our positions. Yeah, and it, it's time that there is another social media platform that can overtake a Facebook, that can overtake a Twitter, because right now we're essentially down to two or three, mm. uh, except for a TikTok or something like that. But let's face it, um, that, that's just dancing videos for 30 seconds. Mm. Um, there's got to be something better coming down the well, pike I wonder, in the future. We're, we're in a constitutional republic, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's the form of government that we all decided upon, uh, representative constitutional republic, and repre representational down to the last person. Not like, I mean, it's, it's based loosely on Roman culture, but instead of only rich people getting to vote, everybody gets to vote, right? That's essentially what we decided. Everybody's created equal. 
equally technically there's a grammatical error in the constitution but anyways uh i feel like at what point does one of these people become too powerful and then demonstrate their ability and 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 desire to to implement that power in an evil way before they become a de facto king or oligarch in this country and you know what happens to kings and oligarchs in this country right we kick them the fuck out or they get hanged it's one of those two things so so when is that coming for Zuckerberg? I, I wonder when. I mean, I'm not. I'm not advocating violence against Mark Zuckerberg. He's a fucking pussy anyway. You could flinch at this guy and he would fucking fall down and shit himself. But uh, I wonder at what point and in, through what methodology are we going to be able to walk up to this guy and metaphorically slap the shit out of him and end his reign of power in this country because he is an he is not a good person. Clearly. Well, I look at it uh, through. So he's, you know, he. I, I, I hear that he's got Navy SEALs on his security detail. I, I can't fathom being uh, an honorable Navy SEAL and protecting a scumbag like him that we now know what, what, what he, <laughs> for a paycheck, I mean, it's just uh, who could do that and look themselves in the mirror at all. Well, I assume he's going, using Gavin DeBecker, uh, right? Say again? I, I assume being in Silicon Valley, he's probably using Gavin DeBecker's security services, right? That's what everybody uses out there. Well, I, well, I, I don't know. I don't know, but um, I'll tell you this. My my solution is that the president has a, an attorney general who, mm. at the top of the DOJ, the, the AG works at the direct pleasure of the president. So the president can assign an attack dog as AG, and I think he should. And I expected that he would have immediately, but we had... <laughs> We had a softy in there for a long time. Jeff and now, Sessions, yeah. Sessions was just like, a, kind of like a non-entity. Yeah. So I was surprised to see that. But he needs someone there with a, a the right legal background, but the personality of a, like a, a mad dog Mattis. Mm. That's yeah. like, a, like, we're coming for you. And we're not making any apologies. apologies. So people that are actually guilty of sedition, and a lot of these these people are a lot of the people at the heads of big tech. A lot of the people that are at the head, the corporate heads of these uh, news agencies. We got only four entities in charge that are that are running all of the major news outlets that are feeding us all this negative, hostile enemy propaganda, which is another huge, huge aspect of the problem here in the United States. So, um, a lot of these people could be prosecuted and should be prosecuted for crimes of sedition and even treason against the we the people. And it's not happening. So why the president has not grabbed off of the shelf some attack dog and put them in as AG and say, hey, you bring 50 or 100 guys that you trust that have your back that will serve the Constitution and serve the American people in good faith. And you unscrew the DOJ and you re-legitimize that. And, uh, le and let me put uh, several people in top and the top uh, directorate positions of the FBI, the CIA, and have them bring 50 or 100 guys that they know and trust that will that have honor and integrity and that will carry out the culture down those agencies and to get those agencies back on the true charter, the original charter for which we funded those agencies uh, to, to protect our, our constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Then we would see thousands of, of arrests of domestic enemies and anyone that's come up against our, our Constitution has made themselves factually a domestic enemy, and they need to be prosecuted accordingly. So what we're seeing right now is a malaise and a lack of enforcement. So I say uh, the soul of our nation is sick watching a lack of enforcement. So people have lost confidence. They've lost faith in the, faith in the system. So nothing's really effective anymore. So we need to start a restructuring of our key agencies, and then we can go after all these scumbags, whether it's someone like uh, George Soros, who, who lives in our country along with others. And, you know, we've got foreign countries kicking him out, and he's not welcome to run his businesses or live there, yet he's still allowed here, and he's undermining us. He found hundreds of subversive organizations and, and, and pays them, to undermine our country and we allow him to do it that seems unthinkable to me i cannot comprehend why that is tolerated and why he is not in a box uh, begging for his life every day for what he's done yeah john adams got a lot of heat uh in the early very very early 19th century for passing the aliens and seditions act right so if you were 
cruising around and you were an American citizen, which the laws were very narrow back then for American citizens, mm-hmm. and you were fucking around being anti-government, they would boot you out. Took a lot of heat for that, rightfully so. That was probably a bad decision. But we have, we have clear and defined rules for citizenship now. We know exactly who belongs here and who doesn't. And then uh, we know exactly who can broadcast. Like, look, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. So the First Amendment is what it is, but there are limitations just like there are with any other right. So at what point does the fact that eight individual companies in the country own all of the major media publications, for example, eight eight companies. Right. So four that he was talking about are the major ne- major networks mm-hmm. and then there's four other ones that there's four other ones that own newspapers and and various other media outlets, yep. cable news companies, all this stuff. So there's eight in total. At what point does their influence become like we said before with with other stuff with social media become like a public utility mm-hmm. and then they have the same responsibility to America to provide true information that the government does under penalty of law. Right. Like you don't want to run into a situation where you have a state run media. Obviously, we're not commies. Right. But there has to be some kind of there has to be some kind of recourse for false representation in the media. And currently there's not. I mean, the, the, the recourse now is we just run 24 more hours of of content and everybody forgets about the last 24. That's the current recourse. Maybe you get a black eye for a week. But as it stands right now, CNN can say whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, uh, and it's only going to get worse, by the way, because more and more of these media companies are getting bought and sold to each other. Trump tried to break it up uh, with the the AT and C Comcast merger, um, but the courts passed it and allowed it to go. Um, you know, I've seen it out in LA for years and years and years. You know, it starts off as NBC, then it's NBC Universal, then it's NBC Universal Time Warner, and it's all these companies keep gobbling each other up until you're just down to a few left. Um, so to me, I think it's only going to get worse and worse unless the government steps in. And well, says, the problem hey. is the, the government has stepped in and then we get res- we get resolutions like uh, Obamagate, which has somehow disappeared from the media already. <laughs> like we already are. Yeah. We, we today, Friday, which is a bad news day anyways, but in general, Friday, I don't see shit about Obamagate on even conservative newspapers. Right. This is a big fucking deal that an outgoing lame duck president used the national security apparatus and the department of justice to fucking sabotage the incoming president. That is a big fucking deal. That mm-hmm. is sedition by definition. doesn't matter what his fucking rank was, but it's over now. So yeah. And, and Trump isn't a nice guy. He's a dick. So it's okay to fuck him over. That's, that's the fucking logic in your head. It hasn't, it used to be where if someone I was diametrically opposed to as a human being, was elected president, that person's name then becomes Mr. or Mrs. President. I don't give a fuck what you believe. It's about the flag pen on your chest, Mm -hmm. and that's it. And it's about the rank on your collar or your sleeve, period. But now it's not like that anymore. And people have resigned themselves to this, and I think it's what you were talking about earlier, Craig, that there's, there's, there's some kind of fucking, and I'm not a religious person, but there's some kind of breakdown in general morality where people feel like it's okay to do fucked up shit to people they don't they don't agree with anymore, like it, oh. it, and that that is that is the fundamental basis for fundamentalism and crazy bullshit happening in the world. That's what fucking Islamist terrorists believe. Mm-hmm. So is that the group that you want to be fucking categorized with? Really, somebody that's like, well, we'll do anything to win, man. Hell yeah. No, what makes us different? What makes America different is that when we go into a room, we look before we shoot. That, that's what makes us fucking different than these assholes we've been blowing up for all these years. That's the difference, if you're fucking curious out there. And we don't throw gay people off rooftops. Yeah, Those are the differences. So I don't get it. I'm very frustrated with how things are going. Yeah. Well, you know, moral decency is one of the factors that, that made this country great because it's uh, it was founded, you know, for people that aren't spiritual or religious-minded, it was founded off of... of the principles in the Bible and whether you, you like the Bible or not, it was, it was written by a bunch of old wise dudes with a lot of information from a bunch of old, other old and wise dudes. And there are things that have been learned throughout human history that are, that work. The, the foundation of, of decency 
and how not to get yourself into trouble by raping children and all these other things. So when people try to reinvent the wheel morally, like we're just going to ignore all of human history, we're going to start over and we're just, anything goes and we're just going to wing it. Well, they get, they get into trouble and, and it starts to cause a lot of uh, calamity and, and damage and they don't understand why because they've ignored all the lessons learned shared with them and the, the, the best selling book of all time. So I think it, it's, it's, it's tragic and unfortunate to see, but I think our, our country was founded on some pretty cool principles. What, you know, the, the early slavery thing was just wrong. And that's, I, that's unfortunate that that was ever a part of our country. Uh, but, but generally speaking, the moral decency of, of what we're supposed to be about here has, has allowed us to have things like a hard work ethic, man, and to, uh, and treat your neighbor the way that you want to be treated. And, uh, and to work together and all these things, rally. we've got um, a really successful and productive comfort country that uh, a lot of people want to come to. And, um, you know, I think it's worth fighting for still. I think it's worth salvaging and fighting to get back the good things that we've lost and continuing to fight the, the, the bad things that are trying to encroach and, and take it all from us. So, you know. Um, I agree yeah. with you on that. I mean, I think uh, America is unique in that the promise of the way we establish this country and what what the idea is behind I mean, the, the, the idea of liberty, that the true unbridled liberty that America represents is so strong that we've seen we've seen people in abject poverty who are literal slaves volunteer for military service to fight for that country because they believed in it so much. And we've seen people in internment camps in the early 20th century during World War II that were treated very unfairly volunteer from there because they knew as bad as it was for them right then that this was the best place to be for not just them but their children and grandchildren. And I, I feel like America is unique in that regard. Uh, a lot of people... A lot of people give a shit for American exceptionalism and claiming to be better than everybody else. It's not about better or not, but look, when when people are looking to immigrate somewhere, it's usually not Europe. Mm -hmm. They're usually trying to come here, yeah. frankly, and there's a reason for that, and it's it, it's borne out through history. And we have a responsibility. I feel that myself um, now that I'm not involved in the military anymore to make sure that this is a country worth fighting for. I think that should be every American's goal when they wake up in the morning. I'm gonna do, start at the lowest level. I'm gonna make this household worth, you know, the, the emotional struggle that it takes to be a person in 2020. I want my kids to be happy, my, my spouse to be happy, whatever the case is, and then keep graduating that up. Make your local community great, make your state great, make this country great, make it great again. And, and we are fucking failing. And every way we're failing at doing that. We, we let government walk all over us. We let corporations control us from day to day. And it's, we, we, we've become so polar, like split between these two fucking banks of ideology that we can't see the forest for the fucking trees. At this no, point. and the, the media keeps, you know, driving a fucking spike right through the middle of this country. I mean, have we not seen this before? Yeah. Is the art of war not very clear on conquer and divide or divide and conquer? Like, is it really not like the oldest book on military warfare that we have clearly lays out what the fucking media and corporations are doing and government are doing to us as the people in this country. And somehow we're fucking like, oh, it's looking at guys. Here's what happened. We provided such an absolute sanctuary, an incubator of freedom and liberty that the people that grew up in it don't have any idea what it took to create that nor what it takes to maintain it and they take it for granted and they're voting to tear it down out of ignorance right so we've provided that it's a beautiful thing but uh divide and conquer is an old strategy yeah. and everybody knows it because it's it's effective mm. and i've always said beware of the dividers we've got yep. a media that's going to divide us uh by every means possible and it's hostile that is a hostile propaganda campaign because they mean to have us scattered before our enemies so that we're more easy uh, to to overcome and to control and we must throw that off and try to unite as much as we can because if you take people from polar opposite ends of the country and different political you know views and all that if you sit them down and put their feet up and you say 
you two people just talk about what you care about for people like to leave the politics out of it out of it they don't disagree on that much they they really just disagree on what they think the government should do right about things but right? that's and that's as that's as old as the country right i mean jefferson and hamilton argued at nauseum like about the role of federal government in the daily lives of America. This is not new. This has been going on since the founding of our country. That argument is a good argument, and it's one that we should have with every with every single generation should be continuing to have that argument. Mm-hmm. But when it when it becomes like you said, so bifurcated that that we can't even have that conversation, then everything starts to break down. Like that is the well, foundation. Even our, yeah, even our social media programs though, we're talking about the oligarchs that are dividing us. They write the algorithms to separate us further. And I challenged some of the senior people at, at uh, Facebook on it uh, several years ago when they first started changing the algorithms that got so uh, hostile to us. When I first started seeing I was getting shadow banned and stuff, I said, what's going on with these algorithms? And they said, Craig, it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's just created to give a, a better user experience. So, like, if you're after a certain kind of people, that's those are the people that you find and you have a better user experience. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. What's mm-hmm. actually happening is you're pigeonholing us into separate corners. Yeah. And separate so that now we no longer talk in the, in the neutral middle. Now we no longer have intelligent debate, spirited as though it may be. It's no longer intelligent and we're no longer engaging in exploring mutual solutions we're pigeonholed and hating and squabbling about each other. And there's this divide that one day will be insurmountable if we're not careful. So I don't think they're doing us a favor by giving us writing algorithms to give us a better user experience. I think it's a a divide and conquer tool. So we need to be aware of that. Yeah, I agree. Well, I mean, look what come out, came out of the first generation of Americans, the federalist papers, for example, and then all the writings, I, I can't list them because we don't have time for that, but all the writings of Thomas Jefferson and his in, individual liberty you know, theory, uh, which is uh, the, the foundation of the Republican Party, right? So it's like, this, this has been going on forever. And those are good ideas to have. The role of government should always be, this, especially in, in a situation where, theoretically at least, the people are supposed to have control of everything. There should be a continu- There should be a continuous debate about what the role of government in our day to day lives is, and if all these other things come in and stop that from happening, then we have a real fucking problem on our hands. I mean, this is our country that we're talking about. It's not. It's like you have a house and the foundation starts to crumble. No one on earth would just ignore that, but for some reason, because it's so large, because it's three hundred and twenty million people now instead of the five people in your household, mm-hmm. it's a, it's it's. I don't know if we see it as a problem too big to fix, if we're cowards, or if people just don't give a shit. Like I can't figure it out, but it's got to be. There's got to be some solution there. I, I think it's one of those things where everybody's busy, everybody has their own lives. Nobody really stops to to think or take the time to consider the country and everything else that's going on in it. As long as their their lives and their family is is fine uh, for for that day. Um, and truthfully, with media and the way stories are coming in and out of people's lives so quickly, I don't know that everybody will take a breath and then go back to, all right, great, maybe we should get back to this, this ideology, um, especially now. If it's, if it's not working now, when we're all at home, everybody's you know behind closed doors, you're with your family and all that other stuff, if, if you don't come out of this and things are changed, it's probably not going to change, and that's the saddest part about this, uh, to be honest with you. Um, Craig, we could talk to you for hours and hours and hours. Uh, this is the point in the show where we get to the drinking bro of the week, which is uh, someone who has inspired you or helped you become the man you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? And it can be a, a woman too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, m- my dad was a he was a just a fantastic man. And talking about child abuse, his father was beating him to death when he was five years old, and his mother, my grandma walked in and caught it and she shot his dad off of him with a shotgun and he ended up dying uh, and my dad I guess had because child predators a lot of them were abused as children so my dad had every excuse I guess under those parameters to be a bad guy or an abuser but he became the opposite instead and he made himself 
he forged himself daily to be the man that he wanted to be. And uh, for him, he was a, a, a spiritual man. He was reading the Bible all the time and studying those lessons and how to make himself better. And he ended up being the best man I've ever witnessed anywhere. He had such integrity, and I and I couldn't when I when I was off on the SEAL team, I couldn't go home and take him out to to lunch anywhere or dinner without people hugging him and begging him to remember uh, the the time when he prayed with their. Uh, husband while he was dying of cancer in the hospital and and changed the lives of their family and how he went to the prison and and, and ministered to some of their nephew or uncle or something and how it, how it changed people and how they're better now and I just, he just changed so many people's lives I was like man that's different than what I did with my life I was a warrior I wouldn't kick the pants out of bad guys and stop them from wrecking uh, the world you know and uh, my dad went about making a different contribution so I say as I grow older I look more at at the man that he was and I want to be more like that and so I really have a, a level of respect now that I've got a lot more experience and wisdom in my older years now I can appreciate why he was that way. He got it. He understood what really matters at the end of the day. He was a real man. And uh, I realized real man's not just all about being macho and mm. tough and, and doing all these great things. Physically, it's about helping people. What are you, if you don't have the moral courage to stand up for what's right and to help people, then what is your all, what is all your masculine macho manhood really about? So that and that's something that we're seeing with child trafficking. I'm begging people to help me. They, you guys are. You guys are amplifying the voice. So you have moral courage to step up and say this is not okay. But a lot of other people that fancy themselves big time warriors or you know extreme ownership or this or that, they can't cower far enough and run far enough from this topic. They won't touch it because they don't know what to say unless somebody not approves. Somebody online may not approve of them standing up against child trafficking and raping children, so they say nothing. So, you know what? Here's not only to my dad, to somebody that for somebody that stood up for what's right, but everybody now who stands up on behalf of the children and says, "This is not okay. This is something we should all unite on and uh, and agree upon." To where you can't rape children, man. That's no go zone, and that's the end of it. So. Absolutely. Stand up. Cheers. Cheers. A a absolutely. Yeah. Because we, look, we've certainly been advocates, big advocates for that. I'm on, more on than this show. I'm. I'm more than advocate. I think I skirt right down the line of Brand Brandenburg v. Ohio. Like, I'm not telling you to go out there and murder pedophiles, but if you do it, I will fucking. Uh, uh, you'll get, at least get a thumbs up for me and a beer I mean, yeah. we'll buy you beer as well uh, you can't monetarily incentivize it you can't no you can't that would be illegal but you can say i don't give a fuck if it happens and if somebody's out there building targeting packages using the national sex offender registry and putting mm -hmm. them online and paying people to fucking murder pedophiles i honestly think that might be a public service i do too uh, and if anybody wants to come try to prosecute that case, Drinking Bros will be all over it. I promise you that. <laughs> uh, last question for you. How did you get the nickname Saul, man? I know your, your last name is Sawyer, obviously, but I have a feeling there's yeah. a little bit more to it than did that. Did you carry the 249? Did you zipper somebody? What happened? I, <laughs> I, it started in, in elementary school, play keep away with the football. My mm. buddies just, you know, we play with each other's last names, Saul Mug, Saul Dude, Saul Man. So it, it started there, and it, and it became my call sign. Uh, for the same reason in the SEAL teams. And I did, as a sniper especially, I tended to carry the heavier weapon. Mm. So my favorite sniper rifle, quote-unquote, uh, was was a highly modified, very expensive HK-91, mm. or HK, uh, man, it's 21? Yeah, HK-21 belt-fed machine gun, 762, 800 RPMs, uh, fired from the closed bolt, so it was accurate. And I could stand on that throttle and burn through inch blocks and things like that when I needed to from the pod of a helicopter. So uh, it, it was kind of multiple things, but really it's primarily just a play on my last name, Sawyer. Ah, I like it. Either way, I like it. I think he should have his own show, like Dog the Bounty Hunter. You know? Maybe not like that. Going after <laughs> pedophiles on a week-to-week -week basis, that would be the, the ratings on that would be way higher than live PD. Well, I mean, uh, what was that? To catch a predator, yeah, was pretty. To big, catch a yeah. predator, still on today. Yeah, oh. but I don't. I, again, I don't know if there's any uh, 
like to catch a predator is 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 a very soft look at what have really goes on there. They expose a lot of people, yep. and I'm glad that they do it. Yeah, but it's a soft look. It's a whole different thing when a fucking bearded goddamn uh, ninja runs into the room and starts fucking people up. Imagine if it was him, dude. That would be the greatest. Well, I watched it. It's his. If if you watch his uh, documentary, there's a lot of that. It's yeah. Very, it's very to catch a predator esque, and and uh, to be honest. I kept hoping that somebody was going to resist or was armed because I want to watch that motherfucker die. I'm Look, I know that's sick and fucked up and normal people don't get it, but I want to watch the fucking life leave his eyes. Yeah. I want to watch him die in front of me. I want to watch all the blood drain out of his fucking body. Yeah, I, I, I do as well. And, and again, after the documentary, I was like, I, I don't understand why nobody's approached this for a TV series. But I guess it's a subject, like you said, that nobody really wants to touch. But you'd be the guy to do it, man. And it would be fascinating well, are, as, as hell. There are, there are three of the most powerful production companies in the industry uh, already in talks uh, to make a series on the, the topic. So uh, here's to them for having the courage mm. to step up and do that because – Quite frankly, I didn't think that they would. You know, some of these guys, they're veterans and, and they're law enforcement veterans and they've worked on these, uh, you know, crime, uh, the crime of child sex trafficking, some of them for 30 years. So their hearts are in it. But they'll tell a good faith story and we'll go run operations and, and do a lot of good. So that looks like it's coming, guys. So awesome. Well, hey, the saw man cometh. Where can everybody find you on social media and tell everybody where they can find your nonprofit? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it's a nonprofit because that's my priority, guys, mm -hmm. is for the children. So uh, vetsforchildrescue.org is the website. There's a Veterans for Child Rescue uh, Facebook page. Um, and there's a Vets for Child Rescue Instagram and Twitter as well, and even one on LinkedIn. So look for those uh, for me. My biggest social media is, is probably the uh, Facebook page, Craig Solman Sawyer. And Great. Twitter Craig R. Sawyer. And I've got Instagram as well. My Instagram, I lost 60,000 followers there. So, uh, but find real Sawman on Instagram. Let's rebuild that page. That'd Wait, be nice. you saw, <laughs> you said you lost 60,000 subscribers. Yeah, on there was a, there was a little weasel who, uh, we had to work out of our organization. She was, she was wanting to, she basically she was, she was up to no good. Mm. And so we, we removed her and she got real bitter. And she still had the uh, um, the login information apparently to my Twitter, Oof. and she went in months later and deleted fifty thousand followers. And Twitter, and I wrote Twitter, I mean Instagram, and I told them what happened, and they said we can't recover your account. So uh, eventually, I started a new one, and then I saw anyway uh, they they deleted my account two more times, and so now Yikes. I'm on my fourth account and it's only just now up to like 10 grand uh but it's years later so it's, it's been a good sixty thousand people that i've lost and it's just not gaining momentum anymore so that's we we're talking about oligarchs earlier you know mm. um yep. well hey yep. craig man it has been an absolute pleasure thank you for coming on today um you're a champion for the people for uh d'anthony d'anthony holloway craig sawman sawyer i'm ross patterson we are the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone.